FBI Special Agent Jerry Clark describes the first thing he saw when he showed up at the bank robbery that would later become the pizza bomber case. So I could, I could, I was as close as I wanted and closer to see that he had a shirt that said guess, and I could clearly see it said guess on it. And then underneath it said jeans, but guess mm -hmm. jeans. Mm -hmm. And it was a white shirt and he had, he, he had this thing under the shirt and I could definitely see it. And I, I thought initially it looked like, you ever see someone with a neck injury? They wear that halo yeah. like. That yeah. or they have yeah. the scoliosis and they had the neck brace, you know, to yes. scrape. Yeah. That's yeah. exactly the metal what thing I was around them. Yeah. thinking. I thought, boy, it looks similar to that, but he definitely had something under it. Uh, I didn't know at the time that the trooper, Jim Szymanski, who did an outstanding job, actually ran up before I got there when they first initially handcuffed him took his knife out, slid, slit the shirt and opened it and looked and actually saw the device. Welcome to Game of Crimes. Welcome back, all of our players, playerettes, dudes, dudettes, and all of you in between. This is, again, Morgan Wright, episode 47 of the original unadulterated Game of Crimes, here literally with my partner in crime. Steve Murphy, and everybody calls me Murph, and truly, truly thank you for joining us here on Game of Crimes. We guys, we, we appreciate it. It's been, we've hit, like I said, we've hit a huge milestone for us, faster than we thought we would, and things are just cranking along, and I can't believe we are up to episode 47. <laughs> Me either. <laughs> Quarante siete. You know, it's funny because when people say, you're telling people about Game of Crimes, they, they say, who are your guests? And you start going through them and you can't remember half of them anymore because there's just been so many. But man, we've had some fabulous guests on here. No, we, we, we remember everybody, Murph. They're, they're, they're memorialized forever on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google, you name it, you know, up on our website. It's just your bookshelf has gotten much, much smaller. <laughs> The capacity for what remains on the shelf it seems to dwindle daily. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I will tell you real quick before we get into our housekeeping, we got a lot. Let me tell you, a lot of dog lovers replied to Ted Dolan's episode. Sweet. I tell you, it, you, you, were, you were not kidding. And this is we, – we don't – we rarely do one-episode shows, again, because of time constraints. But just for that one episode, there was a, as much emotion packed into that one episode as we've had in almost any episode. Yeah, it was. And, it, you know, thank you, Ted, for coming on and, and bearing your emotions with us. And I mean, a dog is it's a partner. It's just like uh, if especially if it's your partner. You know, when my partner got shot in Miami, I was ready to kill somebody. And I just can't imagine what Ted went through there. Well, Bluck served a much higher purpose. He got like, uh, I like what Ted said. He said this this idiot didn't realize it, but he just put another 250 dogs on the street, thanks to Christy Schiller and Canines for Cops. So we've got some more episodes coming up of that. But hey, man, hats off to you guys. Great story. And thank you for all the comments coming in. Just some quick housekeeping. Speaking of Google and Apple and Spotify, head on over to Apple and Spotify because they actually have this feature where you can rate five stars. You got to give us five stars. Game of Crimes, five stars. It just, it all, all the stars align. So just head on over there. Also head on over to our website, gameofcrimespodcast.com for everything. We got our book list, which when we talk about this episode, four books we're adding to the list from our buddy, Jerry Clark. We'll talk about him for a minute. Uh, anything we have on there, our merch list, follow us on the social media at Game of Crimes on Twitter, at Game of Crimes Podcast on Facebook and the Instagram. But where you got to be, where you got to be, where you got to be is on Patreon, patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. And Steve, we don't give it away, but we just recorded, I think, our most unique 911 What's Your Emergency episode ever. Hey, not only is this a strange story, but it's it's freaking educational because it involves something that as a law enforcement officer for 38 years, now I've been retired for nine years now, I had never heard about what we discussed. So you got to come on and listen to this one and see what we're talking about because it just it opens your eyes to a whole new level of stupidity out there. Yep. People are stupid. Here's your right. sign. That's right. There's no fixing stupid, as Ron White says. So, hey, but guys, no, but seriously, we got a lot of great content on there. Um, uh, by the time you have you hear this, our live stream will have been out where we do Patriot Day. So Mark Wahlberg, uh, buddy of Ed Davis, uh, when we talked about the best in Boston Marathon bombing. So we've got some really good stuff over on Patreon. So go to patreon.com slash 
Game of Crimes. And if you're just hanging around, go over to paypal.com, use our email, Game of Crimes Podcast at gmail.com or paypal.me slash Game of Crimes, whatever it makes it easier for you. Now, before we get into the good stuff, we got to tell you about the bad stuff. Mm-hmm. And the bad stuff is our disclaimer. This is a show about crime. We talk about bad people doing bad things and bad people doing bad things to good people. We do take the story seriously, but... We never take ourselves serious. That's what makes the show so much fun. That's why we keep coming back every week. And we keep coming back because, once again, it's that time. And what time is it, Murph? No, it's not the Blue Plate special time. It's (laughs) time for... (laughs) You made me look at the clock. Am I late? (laughs) It's time for... For Small Small Town town Police Police Blutter. Oh! And what do we always say, kids? Don't do meth. Well, this one is not about <laughs> meth, but it's something just as bad. So, Steve, a tree cutter faces several charges after leading deputies on a chase. Now, that sounds like a standard headline. Yeah. You know, this is actually in Florida. Oh, right. Our guys from Florida, Escambia County, uh, Pensacola tree cutter. He led sheriff's deputies on a 10-mile chase from Molino to near Century, and he told deputies he was trying to smoke all $500 worth of his crack cocaine before he got pulled over. <laughs> Well, you got an investment there. You don't want to waste your investment, right? <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, can you go up and tell a jury that? <laughs> How much pity do you think they're going to have? Or tell a judge. Well, hey, judge, at one I'm point, guilty. <laughs> at one point, John Wesley Montgomery, 32, at one point drove through fields and tried to run a deputy off the road. He finally plowed through a fence, and that's what finally stopped him. Stupid. <laughs> Uh, Like we say, there's a whole new level of stupidity on a daily basis in our world. Yes. And now this comes from a place to where it was illegal to do what we're about to talk about. Maybe it's legal. Somebody say, no, it's legal now. Well, it was illegal, but we still get people calling in. Steve, 3.35 a.m., somewhere in the standard area. And that's what it's called, standard area. A woman on Serrano Road said two people were in her backyard cutting her marijuana plants. Okay, is that, which part of this is illegal, growing them or cutting them? I don't. Oh, I I don't, I just can't imagine calling the cops to report that. Well, here's one you can't imagine calling the cops for. I can't imagine they wrote it up this way. Disorderly person, the 1100 block of West Grand Avenue. Somebody reported that a duck was in a parking lot drinking beer and yelling at people. Oh, that, that's a talented duck there. <laughs> we got a hold of that. We'd have a TV show, wouldn't we? Oh, that is, um, if you drink enough, you can become a fucked up duck. So. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. But boom, boom. <laughs> but boom, boom. But thank you very much. Hey, but we're going to end. If, rather than doing what year was it, we're kind of branching out a little bit. We'll get back to that. But hey, I thought I'd give you the strange, strange crime clipping. That's what we'll call it. The SCC. Okay. Strange crime clipping. Time traveler skips town. Duh. (laughs) Self-proclaimed time traveler Andrew Carlson, the enigmatic Wall Street whiz, jailed on insider trading charges, has vanished without a trace. He claimed to be a visitor from the year 2256, and he jumped bail before a scheduled court hearing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he, he tried to he tried to make everybody he was a time traveler. He, had an, he said with an initial investment of over $800, only $800 in two weeks' time, he had a portfolio valued at over $350 million. Every trade he made capitalized on unexpected business developments, which simply can't be pure luck. Now, this is according to him, but the only way he could pull it off, though, as they found out, he wasn't a time traveler. Yeah. Illegal inside information. And he's going to sit in a jail cell on Rikers Island until he agrees to give up his sources. So... Well, if they can't find him, I'd suggest they go down to the local mental hospital. He declared that he traveled back in time from over 200 years in the future, where it is common knowledge that our era experienced one of the worst stock plunges in history, yet anyone armed with the knowledge of the handful of stocks destined to go through the roof could make a fortune. He's a time traveler. (laughs) He's a moron. (laughs) If he's a time traveler, he should have been able to read the damn paper to find out he's about to be arrested for insider trading and not come back. That's just like a psychic. You go in and they say, what's your name? What do you tell me? Yeah, you tell like me, it. pal. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right, so time traveler skips town. No, he didn't skip town. He just traveled back to where he began. Yeah, to the loony bin or to lock up. To the That's loony bin, right. Where he belongs. Well, now, speaking of where we belong, we belong right here, right now, because we're not in the loony bin, even though we're candidates for it. But I'll tell you what, this next case, 
The case itself belongs in the loony bin because it is the strangest case uh, you know, I've, I've ever heard of. I mean, and it's not the fact that it's a huge, we did a, um, a Patreon episode about the uh, uh, Timothy McVeigh, Terry Nichols, the Oklahoma City bombing. That was a complicated, huge, complex investigation involved thousands of people. Mm-hmm. This one was not a big case in terms of total number of people, but it is probably one of the most complicated complex cases any one agent's ever had to handle. Oh my gosh. I, th- I tell you what, Jerry Clark, who's our guest on today's show, is uh, unbelievably tenacious and committed and focused on his mission, along with uh, his partner's case, an ATF agent, uh, Jason Wick, I believe was his name. These guys pursued this case for, what was it seven, eight, ten, seven 11 years. years? Oh my gosh. And it was, it's, it's described in his book as the most shocking and bizarre bank robbery ever. I've never heard of this case. But it was the pizza bomber case. It's been on Netflix. It's been, you know, they've made documentaries about it. It's about the guy that had the collar around his neck, the pizza delivery driver. Yep. And they were going to rob a bank. And, you know, in, in the FBI, they, they designate significant cases as major cases. Like, I mean, you know, 9-11, the Oklahoma City bombing, uh, the Lindbergh kidnapping. I think that was the first major case they ever had. And this case qualified as case 203 in the major case under the FBI's investigation. Um, it, <laughs> there's so many twists and turns in this thing. And there's people manipulating others. Uh, Jerry Clark turned out to be one of the best people we've ever interviewed. He's got a great sense of humor. His Funny recall, guy. His recall is unbelievable. Well, and he's a, he's a teacher of Utes. He's a teacher of Utes. But he's a, he is an Erie, Pennsylvania guy through and through. He mm-hmm. This is a guy who loves his town, loves his area, and wanted to protect his town. And he sure did that. I mean, we don't want to, but, but what I want to tell you, though, is that you got to go to over his site, pizzabomber.com. That's the name mm-hmm. of his website. And he's got four books on there, which is going to be up on our site when you guys read this. On the Lamb about Notorious Fugitives, Mania, and Marjorie Deal Armstrong. She's the crazy lady that we're going to be talking about in oh this my case. Gosh. She's she a wackadoo. And, you she, know, <laughs> and, and they t- she says that when she was a young lady, she was beautiful. There's a picture of her in the book, The Pizza Bomber. Take a look at her. Oh my gosh! I don't know what the the level of beauty is, but if that's the top level, ooh, that's that's four <laughs> four bottles of tequila. Uh, good looking. Um, <laughs> I don't know if there's enough alcohol for that. Yeah, he also wrote a book called Pizza Bomber: The Untold Story of America's Most Shocking Bank Robbery, which we agree, and then another one, the A History of Heist Bank Robbery in America. So, Jerry's got some great stuff, and let me tell you, great funny guy. Uh, and believe it or not, he's going to let you know he was originally a DEA agent Woo-hoo. before he went to the dark side. <laughs> Luke, I am your father. Come to the FBI. Uh, <sighs> yeah, anyway. and, and he tells you the story. And, and when you listen to him, it makes perfect sense. As my, And let me tell you what, folks, when you hear about uh, Marjorie um, Deal Armstrong and you hear about her background, This was a case, this is, if there was a case ever made for Netflix or Amazon or whatever it was on, all these documentaries and all the different ones, this was definitely the case. But Murph, we're only going to hear about the case if I only ask you the one big question remaining. And that is, are you ready to play the biggest, baddest, most delicious pepperoni laden game of all, (laughs) the game of crimes? Ladies and gentlemen, this one truly is where I got to say this and you know what I'm going to say. Get in, sit down, shut up, and hold on. <laughs> you're not going to believe what you're about to hear. This is its just unbelievable. But thank you, Jerry Clark. There are cases, and then there are cases. And this is one of those that, this is one of those cases. And I think news organizations have described it as one of the most, it's not like the most complicated thing the FBI ever did, but it is certainly one of the most complex and one of the most unique cases I've never heard about in my time. Murph, I know with all the stuff you had with Pablo, never heard about something like this, right? No, you know what? And so we were just talking here before we hit the record button with, with our guest today, Jerry Clark, retired FBI. And as a snowbird coming down to Florida, some of our best friends are, are Kevin and Darlene Barwin from Erie, Pennsylvania. And Kevin and I go out every morning about 6, 6.15. We watch the sunrise. We sit out there and solve the problems of the world every day for about three hours. Then we go with our sunburns and we get ready for the rest of the day. But um, he's always, Kevin is uh, one of the best researchers I've ever met in my life. He's written his own book actually about uh, 
where he grew up, Pennsylvania. But he was, he always listens. He's gracious enough to listen to me talk about the podcast. And he said, you know, I've been thinking about this. Have you ever heard of the Pizza Bomber? I'm like, ah, oh, no, it's not ringing a bell. And so he gave me, a, you know, a three minute description of it. And I thought, man, I can't believe I've never heard of this. I got I got to do some research. So I did some research. I found your book online, uh, got the book. It's one of those books when you start reading it, you can't put it down because you're going to see, you want to see what's the next step in the investigative process. Because you guys, it's like, it's like going for the DC snipers, Morgan, where they were looking for two black guys in a, in a uh, white panel van. This, and I'm not telling Jerry's story here because he's getting ready to tell you, but they were misled from the very beginning about who the potential suspects were. And through the perseverance and the experience and the expertise and the dedication of the man we got on the show today, people were behind bars for the rest of their lives where they freaking deserve. So, Jerry Clark, bless you, brother. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's an honor to meet you and have you on here with us. Uh, thank you so much. I, I, I can't tell you what an honor it is to talk to both of you. I, I'm just humbled to be on the show and and just uh, thrilled to talk to you about wait, this. Wait a minute. You're former FBI, and you said you're humbled to be on our show. Wait a minute. You're not FBI. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Hard to believe. Well, I was a DEA guy first, so that might explain oh, something. Oh, right? there, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Look at this. There, yeah, there, there you go, go. Steve. That one's but, for you, Steve. <laughs> thank you, Jerry. And what I want to say is is wait till you get to know Morgan. You may change your opinion. Yeah, you may change your mind. But before this podcast, I didn't know if we were going to get to the podcast with Merce. I thought I did long intros. Uh, <laughs> oh, this is fantastic. This is, I mean, this is a case that's monumental that you've never heard of. I can't yeah. believe it. Uh, and I'm surprised, too. And by the way, too, you can go to pizzabomber.com. There's a lot of good stuff on there. Um, but you know, but Jerry, let's, let's do this as we do with everybody and the kind of in the words of Dominic Polifron, one of our favorite guests too, uh, cause he did the Richard Kuklinski Iceman investigation. You know, how did you get into this thing of ours? You know, how did you get into this thing yeah. called law enforcement? So, I mean, was it a drunken dare? I mean, were you watching, don't tell me you were watching Miami vice and you wanted <laughs> yeah. to get into DEA, just whatever you do. Don't tell me that. <laughs> crack it in tubs. No, you know, I, I'm. A, a guy that uh, had a father that was in law enforcement and was a was a police officer in in the Erie, Pennsylvania area, and I just respected law enforcement so much and what they did, and I saw what he put into that and how much he cared about helping others and all the things that we necessarily don't get credit for anymore uh, that we do for people. And I said, you know what, that's me, and that's that's what I want to do. So. Uh, I had this real love for psychology and, and so psychology and the law was this mix that I thought, wow, this is the perfect combination. And because of that mix, I think it really helped me become a decent investigator knowing, you know, not what people do necessarily, but why they do it because the, what they do, you know, and, and I talk about this all the time in class. If, if you want to kill somebody, you can kill somebody 10 ways or 15, you know, you could kill them by poisoning or stabbing or, you know, shooting or, but why did you want that person dead? And that becomes the interesting part to me. And I've always been fascinated with the why. And so uh, it was just a natural progression to move into that field of, you know, mixing, helping people and why they do the things that they do. And uh, investigation was it for me. So where'd you go to college at? So I'm an undergraduate, uh, Edinburgh University of Pennsylvania. So, uh, psychology ma uh, major. And then again, I had this professor who said, well, you love the law. So look, it's either law school or some sort of psychology in the law mix. And I found a program. Is that uh, you, Jerry? Are you being raided? Do we got to well, cut this off? <laughs> I can't even get to a podcast without getting arrested, but I'll tell you, uh, I found John Jay College of Criminal Justice in yeah, New York City. New York you know? City, yep. So the City University of New York had one of the very first masters in forensic psychology program. So I, I somehow applied, and they thought I was from Edinburgh, Scotland, instead of Edinburgh, <laughs> Pennsylvania, and said, okay, we'll let this guy in. And I got in. And you and didn't have the Scottish brogue, though. Was it a brogue <laughs> or a burr? <laughs> yeah, they go, they go What's, how'd this guy get here from here in Pennsylvania who, who has, you know, not the greatest, you know, academic background, so to speak. But I was one thing in my life I've learned uh, about being persistent versus being, you know, overly um, 
uh, smart. I, I, I got through a whole career of just being persistent and, you know, not knowing that uh, if somebody said no, it meant I couldn't do something. You know, I just said, I'm going around you and I'll figure out a way to get it done. And that's sort of what I did. And then luckily, as the years progressed, the FBI had a university of education program and sent me back for a PhD uh, while I was at the FBI. So I've been able to just keep my education going along with all the experience and just exactly love what I do today. Well, I'm surprised after getting uh, going into the advanced, you know, psychology stuff that you didn't go right into the bureau and go into like um, uh, serial, uh, you know, offenders, you know, the BAU and folks like that. How, co how come you bypassed that? I mean, when you said you didn't have a stellar academic record, that made sense why you applied for DEA first. You know, a lot yes. of the guys that are marginal apply for <laughs> DEA. Easy there, Mr. <laughs> Trooper. Easy there. Uh, you know what's funny about that? At John Jay, uh, they had internships at the FBI. And it was right when profiling at the BAU became involved. So Roger DePew, Jim Reese, John Douglas, John Douglas uh, uh, all the very wrestler, uh, Robert wrestler, wrestler, all the original five, Ken Lanning, they were there in place. And I went for an interview uh, to do, and they only took one that year instead of two. And I was down to four and I didn't get it long story short, but they, I'll never forget Roger DePew telling me, he said, listen, I said, I want to be an FBI profiler. And, and he said, you have to go out and learn how to think like an investigator. And I kept thinking, I, I'm sitting in his office at 21 years old or whatever going, what's that mean? That means nothing to me. Uh, and then years later, I finally figured it out, you know. And so it took me a long time to get where I was going. But I finally got to, to where I was going uh, through persistence and, you know, just not being able to say no. Did you ever meet somebody named William Peters down at the BAU? No. No, I interviewed with Roger DePew, and uh, I had known Robert Ressler, luckily and humbly. I had met him, and um, it was just one of those things where I was like, oh, this is exactly what I want to do. You know, I've got this master's degree in forensic psychology from John Jay in 1985 when no one, no one even no heard one knew of what forensics. it was. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And they said, oh, that's great, but you know what? Go go learn how to investigate. Then we'll talk to you in five years. And that's really what they told me. And as I look back, I think it, it, it was important that I did what I did. So what year did you join DEA? So what happened first was, and, and just like everybody in law enforcement, I was applying to any law enforcement job you could. And mm -hmm. I ended up getting a job as a parole officer here in Erie, Pennsylvania, uh, through the Erie County Adult Probation and Parole. So uh, I spent... A few years doing that, applying to every federal agency I could. And finally, uh, NCIS called, which was NIS at the time, and uh, said, hey, we have a spot for you down at, at Philadelphia. So that was the very first agency I hooked on with. Did you interview with Mark Harmon, the guy at NCIS? <laughs> <You know, laughs> when I heard that that show came out, I said to myself, and I loved NCIS, so I'd never speak poorly, but I thought, boy, that's just not going to catch on. And now I, if I was a critic, I'd be like totally poor because it, it's hooked on to <laughs> several different spinoffs. So and, many different franchises. And I think <laughs> at one time NCIS had like five of the top 20 shows on TV, all their different franchises. Incredible. But, and, I, and, and I loved it, but I, I was mostly doing protective service details for them. So I was sent overseas. I was guarding the, the commander of the sixth fleet over there in Italy and Gaeta, Italy. And, spent a lot of time at the UN doing some, uh, you know, protective service stuff. And then DEA called and I was like, Oh, this is, this is outstanding. So, uh, I went back to another Academy. So I went through Fletzy, graduated Fletzy and thought, uh, you know, you don't want to do 21 weeks anywhere. Uh, so now I'm going to go back to Quantico at DEA and do 21 weeks there. And so for our folks, we have a rule. You can't use acronyms. Otherwise, you got to oh. put money in the kitty. So okay. let everybody know what FLETSI is. So that's the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in Glencoe, Georgia. And it's where basically everybody trains uh, that's not DOJ. So DOJ, you know, mostly trains at FBI Quantico and, and DEA trains at Quantico. Uh, and so I thought, well, all right, 21, let's go. I go back down to Quantico and now I'm at DEA. And by the way, Steve, I was BA-76. So I'm okay. not sure. I was 53. 53. Okay. Yep. 
So BA76 uh, went through there and, and uh, very fortunately got assigned to the Detroit division, the Cleveland RA, which is Cleveland, Ohio is an hour and a half from Erie. So I was love, loving that, you know, and, mm -hmm. and Cleveland had a lot of good work and absolutely, you know, was thrilled to be in the city of Cleveland. So let's let's talk about. By the way, too, if they got an NCIS Erie, would you would you put in for that? Yeah, I would have, I would have stayed right here in Erie and been Mark Harmon of Erie. Although, uh, you know, looks and and intelligence were two things he had over me. But no, hey, 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 no, no, no. Mark Harmon wanted to be you. Yeah, that's yeah. right, pal. I don't know. Hey, I don't know about the other thing too, kind of let everybody knew too about the structure. You said you were in Cleveland, but. The uh, so tell us again. You're using acronyms. You you talked about there's the field offices or there's the RA. So, right. what were you assigned to, and how did that work out with you being in Cleveland? So out of DEA, our headquarters city was was Detroit, uh, but our resident agency so uh, was was out of the Cleveland resident agency in Cleveland, Ohio. And you would think Cleveland would be a, a pretty big office. Um, and and it was, uh, but we had so much good work there. Uh, and what it, kind of work? work? What kind so, of stuff were you guys getting involved in? So on the on the on the drug level, uh, and Steve, I don't know if you remember Operation Pisces, but I ended up getting involved in Operation Pisces for the specific group that would come to Cleveland from Chicago and other areas to pick up dope and go back. And so we had a heck of a operation going out of Cleveland, Ohio, until one of the guys in that was our subject in Cleveland took a, a, a bullet in the ear under the bridge in, in the flats and, and was dead. And so uh, we sort of lost our connection to that operation, but it was a huge DEA operation. And it took me down to Florida and to the Cayman Islands and, and all over just highest level drug trafficking. I, I really enjoyed DEA. Uh, the five and a half years I spent there. Yeah, Cleveland's a tough town, and Pisces uh, was so successful. They had a Pisces too afterwards, one of the biggest yeah, operations. Really. Yeah, so that's pretty cool that you were involved in that. You know, and, and that crappy travel you had to do down the Caribbean. You know, as a taxpayer yeah. of the United States, I appreciate you taking one for the team there, brother. Well, wait a minute, Murph. Uh, <laughs> sorry, where, where was one of your first undercover uh, operations too? Turks and Caicos. <laughs> Turks and Caicos. I've never oh, even heard please. of the place. <laughs> <laughs> wow. and, and here i get sent to Atomwa, iowa or something i know that's probably what happened to me no <laughs> only the best for you morgan only the best. only the best well but 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 were you, so when you said you were just putting in for any agency did you i mean did, were you uh uh you know influenced at all by uh miami vice you know when you looked at that what so when they called you said yeah that's what i wanted did you think you were going to be going to florida wearing hugo boss suits and driving lamborghinis you know, it all looks so interesting that way, but I knew it wasn't very realistic. But at the same time, I definitely wanted to get involved in in really complex situations, you know, things that took some effort, not, you know, shagging guys off the corner uh, necessarily, although that's important in, 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 in its own what, but, wait, but yeah, every every everything has its level it operates at, right? So yes. you know, and the advantage of having feds when I was state and local is you got that breadth, you could do things, but still it's quality of life for a lot of these towns. You got to get the drug dealers off the corner because it's quality of life, but then you want to work it back to source of supply, take the big people off, and that's where the partnership works. That's exactly it. And Morgan, you know what I learned early about state and local this. If if I got involved in federal agencies and I didn't hook with a state and local. I just was not going to get it done. And, and, and here's why. You transferred me to Dayton, Ohio, you know, where I ended up with the FBI, and we can talk about that. And they put me on a violent crime squad. I'm nothing without the Dayton Police Department. I'm nothing without the Montgomery County Sheriff. And I was certainly nothing without that task force working in combination where we take all our strengths. I try to explain this to students. They say, oh, you know, you want federal, you want... No, listen. We do this all together, and here's why. I go to Dayton. I don't know a street. I don't even know where I am. They're saying, meet me on Smithfield Street. I'm going, where is that? I don't even know where that is. And this so, is before <laughs> Waze and Google and everything oh, else. You're like, whoa, where am I at? Give me a map. Are you, are you kidding me? I'm looking on a paper map. I'm going, I don't even know where the hell that is. So if, if you don't hook yourself as a federal agent with your state locals, you're not doing your job. Because I had a Fed tell me one time too, nobody really parachutes into federal jurisdiction. When you look at 
or oh. hijackers. You look at Timothy McVeigh. You look at uh, the pizza bomber case. All of these folks live in communities that, you know, they live in counties. You better believe it. And if I had, uh, uh, you know, we're hunting fugitives and you and you say, hey, I'm looking for a guy named, uh, uh, a nickname, Boo. Well, the FBI doesn't have that kind of database where a state local can even find, you know, nicknames. You know, now you might have a thousand boos, but my point is they can at least drill down into their community. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, that guy lives on this street. His girlfriend works here. I know his, you know, you don't you don't know that as a fed normally because you may not even be from that town. So it's very important, uh, the work that the state and locals do. And and I couldn't have been more proud to work on task forces a lot of my career. Absolutely. Now, how many agents were assigned there to, uh, what do you say, Dayton? Yeah. So what happened is after I'm in Cleveland for about five and a half years, FBI calls. And FBI, you know, that was for me. Well, hold uh, on. Wait a second. You just, yeah. You're just you not sitting at your desk one day and somebody goes, hi, this is the FBI. We noticed you have a degree in forensic psychology. Yeah. We'd like you to come join the bureau. Yeah. Come on. How did this really happen? You just don't gloss over this. No, no. <laughs> if you drill down in, I basically had applied and said, hey, I really want to use this forensic psych. I want to still be a profiler. You know, I love working drugs, but, you know, there's 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 other cases I want to get involved in. And I thought, this is how I thought I was so connected. Oh, yeah, you know, the applicant coordinator, the FBI in Cleveland's going, oh, yeah, we'll get you back to Cleveland. We can help you. <laughs> I got down to the academy, and I became a nobody again. And I had to go back to my third academy. I'm, ma- I'm maybe one of the most <laughs> slow well, learners <laughs> you, could ever, you could ever come across. Uh, no, no, we had Lou Velozzi on. Lou went through what was <laughs> I think Lou went through three academies too than all the other trainings. So he had, he had, by the time he finally got out into the field at ATF between being on the original INS immigration naturalization service, he had more time in the classroom than in the field of the first three years of his career. You know, I, I easily had a year and a half in federal law enforcement training. It, it could have been a degree. Jeez. So when I you graduated. went back to all the instructors wave at you go, Hey, it's Jerry. Hey, welcome back. <laughs> it's Jerry. And you know, what's funny. They were treating me like I had never done a thing. Because here I'm five and a half years work Operation Pisces for DEA, and they're teaching me how to make an arrest. And I'm going, oh, my God, I have to bite my tongue because, uh, you know, and you're certainly not going to get sideways with an instructor. So and I knew better. But I'm thinking if you knew how many people I arrest and how many doors I bang, you would not be telling me this. But at the same time, I I sucked it up and went through it and took it. Well, Murph, I think we're going to, what I want to do is there's, we've talked to a lot of guys from DEA about their academies. I want to drill down with you a little bit about what's it like with the FBI Academy? Is it, you know, you watch Silence of the Lambs and you see them pulling out Clarice Starling and having her go work, you know, the Buffalo Bill case, you know, and everything's just in khakis and nice blue shirts and great chow, right? FBI probably has the best chow compared to all the other agencies, but Oh, so let me, let me tell you what, you're sitting in that cafeteria, you're right over the gun cleaning room. So all you smell is Hoppy's <laughs> cleaning solvent. Am I lying, Jerry? Yeah. Oh, no, that's it. That's, all you, you that's one thing you never it. forget. Yeah. Oh, it's horrible. Well, no, so we, what was I it can, like? What was it like I down there at do Quantico? Here, here, here's the funny thing. So DEA goes down really militaristic, right? Black, BDUs, you know, gray, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, golf. Well, it's not a golf shirt, but it's it's definitely a polo, and and they're you know humping around these big, heavy you know medicine balls because you made a mistake or something, and then there's the FBI in their khaki pants and their blue, you know light blue shirts, and and I used to go look at those guys, you know look how easy it is, and I I, I was remembering how you know it's almost militaristic, right, Steve? I mean, when you go through how how tough the training is physically. Physically, I was in my best conditioning ever, right? Where I go back down years later, and now I'm in the khakis, and I'm getting teased by the DEA <laughs> in the black PDU. So I go, I used to wear those too, so I know how you're teasing me. So I'll take. But but here's the big question: How many memos did yeah. you have to write in the DEA and the FBI Academy? Oh my God! I get to wrote my first <laughs> chapter of my book. So listen, it was crazy. I was always in trouble. I was always behind. Uh, you know, I'm I'm just that type of guy that 
I'm very in, more intuition, uh, you know, instinct guy. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that's the way I do things. And so academically, you know, I can get through stuff. I obviously have a PhD, but I'm more because I just don't say no to things than I am just a real bright guy. I'm just, I'm one of those people. I, I, I say, challenge me and then I'll show you what I can do. Move out of my way. Yeah. I was thinking you got your PhD because you faked being from Edinburgh, Scotland again and uh, yeah, learned how to speak yeah, Scottish. Not as loud, I'm from Edinburgh. Have you ever been to Scotland? No, I've never even been there. That was <laughs> it, the funny part about it. Edinburgh's beautiful. It's is beautiful. it? Oh, it's unbelievable. The land of my people. Yeah. So, uh, so, so you you wrote memos. What was the uh, what was the what was the best memo you had to write let's say at the bureau what what did you do at the bureau where you had to write a memo for that you look back on and you go yeah that was a work of art uh you <laughs> know i it. can think of a couple of things uh that i i i got involved in related to cases and i you know maybe i thought i could have done this better but i did it and and then they'll say well why don't you write a memo about about why you didn't do this well like say for an interview for example I'll give you one example in the pizza bomber case. And, and we're going to talk about that because I, I, I'm just, I can't wait to fill you in on this craziness. But one of the guys that we went to interview said, Hey, I, I, I can't interview right now because I, I got to finish this shift. You know, can you come back on Monday? And, you know, this is like a Friday or something. And, and one of the guys said, okay, we'll be back up Monday morning at eight o'clock. And the guy dies Sunday night of a, of a overdose which we now look back and, and know it was planned. So that's one of those things where you look back and go, oh my God, how did this happen and how did we let this go? So there's been plenty of things that have happened over the course of time where I look back and go, whoa, but those are things that you learn from. And, and now I speak to all over so that when I talk to law enforcement, say, hey, these are one of the things you, you probably should pay attention to. So you yeah. didn't, I mean, like, so I pulled a couple of knucklehead things that I had to write memos for when I was in DEA Academy. No funny stories. Um, should we, should we tell him about Phoebe, yeah. Steve? <laughs> he probably knows oh, about Phoebe. If Oh, down, down at the Academy. Yeah. Uh, was it, you go to Deja Vu with the nightclub down there where, you know, you had a curfew. <clears throat> Remember the curfew? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. So, You'd have a bunch of people. It, it, it'd be like that show uh, with Richard Gere, you know, officer and a gentleman, you know, where they're grabbing each other, going, "Come on, we got to get out of here. We, we got to get back before the curfew." And then the Quantico police would wait for the, all the FBI agents and DEA <laughs> agents to be speeding back to the academy to make the curfew and pull you over for uh, having a couple cocktails. So those are one of the things that we had to get through down there that were really crazy. Yeah, that was tough. Well, even inside the uh, uh, what, what do they call the bar there in the FBI Academy? Uh, um, oh, the boardwalk. The boardwalk. Yeah. The Bo boardwalk. boardwalk or boardroom? Or the boardroom. The boardroom. Yeah. yeah. I'd like to. I'd like to have all the money back for that I spent at that place. Oh yeah. <laughs> and a lot fewer headaches. <laughs> Some people oh, call them God. hangovers. <laughs> yeah. Hangovers. So Jerry, we're not going to jump forward yet, but I just kind of want to book in things because. Uh, the pizza bomber case starts on August 28th, 2003. So you get on DEA in 85. So you say you're there about five and a half years. So you get on the FBI when? I get on in 90. And uh, so I just was down there uh, right in the beginning of 90 and go back down to the academy. Again, I think I'm going to Cleveland. And I don't know if you know how they do this, but they basically, the sixth week you're down there, they bring a box out. You don't know where you're going. You list the 57 field offices of where you'd like to go. But then there's an envelope for every one of the 50 students in the class. And they'll call, they'll pull the first envelope out and go, Jerry Clark, come on up here. And you open up your envelope and you go, I'm Jerry Clark and I'm going to, and I remember looking down, I'm thinking Cleveland, right? And it's Cincinnati. And I go, Cincinnati. And then you have to, I think they even, <laughs> They they haunt you more by making you put a little pin in a in a in a map. <laughs> they just want to see if you can find Cincinnati on yeah. a map. <laughs> and I'm going, oh, yeah. Where the hell is Cincinnati? You know, it's, oh, it's way down there. And, and I so I remember going, 
wait, there's got to be a mistake. You know, I had it all worked out. You know, I'm juiced. I'm put together. I'm going to Cleveland. And, and, and nope, Cincinnati. Yeah, you're still in Ohio, though. What are you bitching about? I know. I couldn't bitch too much because it could have been something far worse for me. Could have been so, the uh, two-man <laughs> RA in Garden City, Kansas, where I was at, if you want to talk about being sent to the hinterlands. Um, yeah. No, but, I, did, I did okay there. So, so how big? Uh, how big was the? Uh, so, how big was the office in Cincinnati? And was it was a resident agency? So, Cincinnati, or was it a field office? That's a field division in, okay. in for the FBI. Mm. And out of and here's what they do even before you get there. So, while you're in the rest of the 22 weeks, you get a call from the SAC, the special agent in charge, and they'll say, "Hey," or the ASAC, mostly uh, assistant special agent in charge, and they'll say. Hey, we're going to put you in the Dayton RA or the Columbus RA out of the Cincinnati division. And uh, that's what happened to me. So I never actually, I, I was in the Cincinnati division, but I was assigned the Dayton, Ohio resident agency. And uh, I think it was because of my background and experience because they immediately put me on a, a violent crimes fugitive task force that we started. I thought they were yeah. going to send you back to working drugs, you know, with Pisces. <laughs> I was sure I was going to end up working drugs. And, and as it turned out, uh, I never ended up working drugs in the FBI. I worked more violent crime. Now, drugs were included in that, uh, mm -hmm. but mostly kidnappings, bank robberies, fugitives, uh, anything violent related that's reactive. And I couldn't have been more proud than the six years I spent on that Dayton Montgomery County Violent Crime Fugitive Task Force. I learned more from those local. Mm -hmm. and state and federal officers than anything I had ever done. That's, you know, and you can't overstate that. And I, you know, I know you've already covered it once there, Jerry, but it's coming out of Columbia. I got assigned to Greensboro, North Carolina. I had to go look on a map to find out where Greensboro was. <laughs> I wasn't familiar with it at all. It turned out to be one of the best places I could have ever gone. Right. But we had five agents to cover 26 counties. It's ridiculous, oh, you know, it's and, and having that for me, having that, that local police experience, because you go into an area like that, and everybody looks at the feds like, oh, shit, not just another fed here. But you go in with that that local background, you know, and it just breaks down so many barriers. It opens up so many doors. And then you don't portray that fed attitude to everybody. And that's when the job gets to be so much fun. So what you're saying, it's really, really important. I'm not sure for our listeners. You know, I just want to make sure they understand the importance of what you're saying there because it's, it's extremely important. Steve, you can't understate it. It's it's so funny. I got there and I'm assigned and we're out in the field in the street with all the Dayton officers and they'd say, oh, another, how did they describe me? Uh, L.L. Bean coat with a badge. And I thought, oh, man, <laughs> here I am, I'm an L.L. Bean coat. And I, I you know, that was big in the day. But uh, so, uh, he, you know, they I had to earn that respect from them. I had yep. to show them, hey, listen, I'm going to get into weeds like you. By the time I left there, I had their radio, I had a call sign, I was a DEA guy, I was an FBI guy, but I was mostly a Dayton police officer to there them. And and I felt more proud of that than anything I, I had done to that date. Absolutely. Did you ever meet somebody named Rich Beal when you were in Dayton? I definitely know that name, Rich Beal. Rich yeah. ended up, as a friend of mine, he ended up becoming chief of police at Dayton for quite a few years. I definitely have heard that name. I... I I was lucky enough to work with Lieutenant Charles Gift, Chuck Gift, and he was such an organized, well-versed guy, and we had more fun. I think we arrested 2,000 violent felons in six years, which tells you, and those were people that nobody could find. We get a stack of warrants every morning, and again, you don't look at the names, you don't look at their color, you don't look at anything. What you look at is their threat and what they've done. Yeah. And we, mm -hmm. we go prioritize get, based on that, like go after the most dangerous ones first. You bet. And we go find them and we track them down. And I got to tell you, uh, I couldn't have been more proud. And, and we had so much luck in what we did. Uh, I'm looking back and, and really some dangerous, you know, shootout, you know, the whole thing. So, all right. You can't just, okay, here we go. You, you, you're the master of just throwing <laughs> stuff at the, oh, we got a dangerous <laughs> shootouts, 47 yeah. million yeah. rounds went off. All right. Give us a, give us a, give us an idea about one of the operations you did uh, to arrest somebody that went south and ended up, you know, one of the things you, you always train for that you hope doesn't happen is, you know, you serve warrants, you go after people knocking down that door, going into these houses. 
it's, I mean, if somebody, if, if you get a cop out there that says that doesn't scare the shit out of them, they're lying because it scares the holy shit out of you to come around a corner. You don't know who's there. The lights may be on or off. God knows what's going on. So give us an example of one of the operations where you guys went to serve a warrant, you know, on a dangerous person and, um, didn't, you know, turn, went South on you. I'll tell you what, uh, one was with DEA and one was with FBI. DEA was an undercover situation where we had an informant and an undercover, and we were meeting someone for a five kilo deal. We were supposed to have the money they were going to, and it was a rip. And I'll never forget this because Steve, you've been on a ton of these. I'm sure Morgan too. Uh, we're sitting on, I'm sitting on surveillance, you know, probably a hundred yards watching the thing. You've been on a hundreds of these and you're just watching. And all of a sudden the car pulls up, bad guy gets out, walks right over with the gun, uh, it looked like a Mac 10. I think it was, a. um, it had a Bren 10. It had the magazine sticking out of the bottom mm-hmm. and the undercover opened the door. He was an undercover police officer from the date. Uh, I'm sorry, from the, uh, Cleveland Heights police department. And his name was Tony Sargent, one of the bravest guys I ever knew. And he opened the door up and all of a sudden he's standing with this guy pointing a gun at him saying, give me the money. So it was a straight rip. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so John Clayton and I, I don't know if you've ever worked or heard of Steve, uh, John Clayton did a ton of undercover with the, uh, DEA in Cleveland. His name's really uh, familiar. Oh man. One of the best undercovers I had ever worked around. And this guy and I were on surveillance together. And so we go running to our partner, right. Who's undercover. And I'm not kidding. The guy's fighting now with the gun, Tony Sargent and this bad guy. And this is how fortunate life can be uh, with luck. He, his finger slid behind the trigger in between the trigger and the, and the guard, the trigger guard. Oh my and God. And the guy squeezing the trigger, but the trigger wouldn't go. Oh, all the, way back. Oh. the magazine drops out. That guy starts running. The guys in the car that he came in, start speeding toward us. Clayton's firing at the car. By the way, talk about one of those memos. We got a memo for that that he was shooting at the tire and not at the vehicle itself because the driver. Yeah. Yeah, the driver. So uh believe it or not. And anyways, uh long story short, we're now in a foot chase with the guy and five blocks away we catch the guy that almost killed my buddy Tony Sargent. So oh my gosh. that was sort of the one uh crazy thing that happened in DEA. Well then the FBI years later we're on a fugitive hunt for somebody and this is the ironic spot this again how how law enforcement and people in in the media and in in the public they don't understand the the fluidness of a law enforcement situation and Mm -hmm. how crazy and quickly things happen all of a sudden the guy just start we're in a project in, in dayton ohio all of a sudden the guy just starts running right now it's not even a guy we were looking for that we believe, but we thought it was interesting. So we start, you know, running after him and he runs into a, 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 one of the buildings in the projects and runs straight up the steps. So our marshal, you know, went to the door and the lady's going, I don't even know who this guy is. He just re- picked a house that had an open door and ran in it, runs up to the top of the stairs. So our marshal and two of our Dayton police officers ran up the steps behind him, swung open the door on a little landing, and he's in that bedroom with, with a Glock and just starts firing. Hits two of the officers, hits, and then the officers shoot back and hit him. The marshal rolls all the way down the steps right to my feet, and then, uh, you know, we, we have three people shot. So, again, one of those yeah. things that's just <laughs> quick acting that you never would have expected – totally unrelated to what we are doing, but that's the nature of law enforcement. Just any second, anything that could happen. Yeah. It's just like they say about military operations. You go in with a plan and as soon as that first, first bullet is fired, <laughs> that shit goes right out the window. Everything's I think going. It was uh it was a Prussian general by the name, I think Helmke or something. He said, your battle plans never survive contact with the enemy. You can do all the True. planning you want, but uh, how did, all three of the officers, okay, recover. Yeah, the two officers and the bad guy all lived, which was fantastic. The two officers took some uh, extremity shots, and the bad guy took uh, a more of a, a mid-center shot, but he lived also. So 
one one good thing that came out of it. But it just makes you realize how quickly things, you know, change. How they can go. There is a funny video on YouTube, and I'll, I'll try and find it, but it's it shows these, you know, they, they've got cameras, they've got body cameras, and three cops are showing up in this hotel room to talk to this guy. I don't remember what the case was, but he's sitting there talking with them. And it looks like he's got a gun. He goes to pull out his gun. They say, drop the gun. So he drops the gun. And then he goes running towards the window. They're like on the 10th floor. And you're thinking, oh, this guy's going to break the window and go out. That Hotels have had this problem before. He hits that thing, bounces off of it, falls onto the floor. And he's just like laying there and they're going. And what I loved about it was just more the reactions of the cops. They're like, they didn't go running after him. They go, hey. Hold my beer. Watch this. And the guy bounces <laughs> off it, lands on the ground. They go, that hurt, didn't it? And then they just arrested him. Here's your sign. <laughs> Here's your sign. Well, I, I, if you have fugitives like I did, you see some of the most amazing, you know, people jumping out of second stories. We've had that happen. Uh, we had one guy that we, we, we literally had him trapped against the river. The, the Miami River in Ohio runs along, and there's a path where you run on. And we're thinking, no, you're not going to do that, buddy, are you? And sure enough, splash, you know, in he goes. And and you're thinking, well, he's got to come out on one, one side of the river or the other. So we'll just float with him downstream here or, or ride downstream <laughs> and get him. But every way that you could figure that fight or flight, again, that's yep. the psychology yeah. of what goes on. And, and And people will do amazing things, not amazing in a good way, but amazing things to get away. And that fear is just overwhelming sometimes. So we've had a lot of different things happen. And I can't explain to you enough when you said going in a door that you have no idea what's on the other side and how dangerous that is, um, how many doors you go behind when you're hunting fugitives over six years. So I got very, and then my five years with DEA going behind doors. So I consider myself to be, you know, so fortunate and what you did over with, and Steve, my God, I mean, I, I can't think of the danger that's involved over there. So I, 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 what I'm trying to say is, and Morgan, your background in law enforcement and experience, what we do just sometimes gets underappreciated uh, until oh, you absolutely. meet us, you don't know how important we are. Well, if you sat having a beer with somebody who knew nothing about law enforcement, you said, yeah, here's what we did last night. So there was a guy with a gun, took a few shots at us. And so we go chasing him. He goes in this door. Uh, we're in hot pursuit. So we kick down the door and there he is hiding behind a door with another door and more people go, what the hell are you thinking? Why are you doing this stuff? But you go, but at the end of the day, if not us, then who, you know, if we yeah. don't do it, who's going to do it? Well, the other thing is they don't hire any of us because we're really, really smart, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> Speak for yourself, Steve, right? That's, Morgan, Morgan, that's what you're saying. No, I'm with, I'm with Steve. I'm not bright enough to figure out that was dangerous. Until now, I look back and go, oh, my God, what did I do? Oh, yeah. so we're talking to Chris Feistel and uh, – Dave Mitchell. Uh, yeah, Dave Mitchell, uh, for the Cali Cartel season three of Narcos is made about them. And the, yeah, you know, I mean, look, we joke, but everybody's smart. And these guys go into a cane field with the head of security for the Cali Cartel, not once, but twice. And it's like they look back on it now and go, what the fuck were we thinking? <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you what, sense. I'm still thinking they need some psychological counseling <laughs> on that one. Uh, uh, and if you want to find out what happened in episode 12, you'll have to go to patreon.com slash game of crimes and hear the most unique way they got out of uh, having their covers blown. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, get that, Steve? Covers blown? Anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, we, we can't give it away on this. Anyway, but hey, yeah. back to our regularly scheduled podcast with Jerry. So you've got uh so by this time then you've got basically um uh, uh 15 uh, 16 years on right when um this this call comes in uh, for yeah. what we now call the pizza bomber right yeah so in the fbi you get on a, a list called an op list that used to it's it's a basically an office of preference list mm -hmm. and i wanted to go back to erie or pittsburgh division in the erie ra and it's funny because in the fbi you could go anywhere in the world uh, like dea or any of the agency, federal agencies. And I, I, I used to always get teased about that. Why in God's name, do you want to go back to Erie? I mean, why is that your top, you know, at your top list? You, I mean, that's where you aspire. And I said, yeah, that's my hometown. I love it there. I feel comfortable there. And if I could do this job there, I would be like hitting the lottery. And so when I got, uh, uh, unfortunately I had a father, um, who had cancer 
Uh, and I'll never forget this. I was in the Cincinnati division, Dayton RA, and my father was in hospice and he had about six months. And um, the FBI did and let me do this hardship, uh, you know, TDY, which is a temporary duty where I was able to go back to the Erie RA out of Pittsburgh and spend more time with my father, which was so compassionate of them and, and so unbelievably um, warm for me. I get choked up right. thinking about it now. But, um, and so I got to spend that time with my father and my, my mom in, 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 in Erie. And while I was there, I'll never forget this, doing my TDY, my OP transfer got announced where all of a sudden they're saying, hey, we have a permanent change of station for you. Uh, to go transfer to, to Pittsburgh Division. So I had to go back to Cincinnati to accept my OP uh, to go back to Erie. So fortunately, I was then transferred back. And I'll never forget it. It was 2001. Uh, and I'm sitting back and I go, oh, my God, I'm an FBI agent in Erie, Pennsylvania, where I used to go visit the FBI agents there and say, hey, I'm going to be an FBI agent someday. And they go, yeah, kid, okay. Right. Yeah. We'll see you get out of it, you know, get out of the way. And to think that I got back there and, and I, it, it was just so proud and, and to be in a city that I loved and, and just, I, I was, I couldn't have been happier. And then uh, August, well, even before that. So I'm there in, in what was that? Maybe January, February of 2001. And then nine uh, 11 hits, right. September 11, 2001, and now, uh, you know, all hell breaks loose for everybody in law enforcement, right? And I had my choice of either Shanksville, uh, where we were sending agents out of the Pittsburgh division, or the Pittsburgh airport because of, you know, at that time, you couldn't fly, you couldn't do anything, it was chaos. So I was at the airport in Pittsburgh for probably a month and a half trying to get that all square. And then... Uh, I, what, I, what what do you mean? What were you doing at Pittsburgh? Was there some kind of uh, uh, intel that said there's a threat there, or you're looking for to see if the any of the hijackers had transited through there? What was the what was so key about Pittsburgh, other than obviously traffic is all fouled up? Yeah, no, it, 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 not that it was maybe something specific, other than leads that were being generated on where they went to flight schools, and everybody was getting leads generated in the FBI of you know how did this <clears throat> you know, case get all put together, but it was more about the flying, you know, uh, pilots were literally saying, I'm not going to fly that person in C six or, you know, got it. and you got to get them off my plane. And I'm like, well, the FBI, you know, that's your plane. If you want them off, I'll interview them. But so it was chaos for a long time at the airports and it wasn't maybe necessarily Pittsburgh alone, but certainly because Shanksville was in the division. Right. And, there was a lot of thought to that. So uh, initially, then they determined it wasn't related. But yeah, so that was total chaos. And, and that changed the landscape of how we do things uh, even today, right? With cooperation between agencies, CIA, you know, intelligence agencies and FBI now speaking better, uh, you know, and before it may have been more siloed off where everybody had their their jurisdiction and their field. Now everybody has a better connectivity, I think. And so some positive things did come out of that whole chaos. You know, I was going to say, Jerry, um, <clears throat> based on my experience working you know, side by side with the FBI, your agency was always more compassionate to their employees for things like your father. Uh, eventually we got to that point, but uh, it was because we had an administrator who came up through the ranks who had a big heart, Michelle Linhart. I tell you, prior to that, and I'm not sure what it's like now because I've been gone for a while, but uh, DEA just, you know, we were not the forerunners on taking care of our employees. And that's the nicest way I can think of to say it. Yeah. Yeah. No, one thing about the FBI, they, they definitely took interest in, in making sure you were doing the right thing. Now, J. Edgar Hoover uh, didn't want agents to go back home. Mm -hmm. He always said, listen, you're going to work in any city in the country, but you're not going back to your home ever. And he felt that if you were in obligation to somebody or you had debt to somebody and you were corrupt and, and I said, you know, thinking about the psychology of that, I'm thinking, listen, if you're corrupt, I'm going to be corrupt in Dayton, Ohio, 
as much as I am in Erie. It doesn't matter where you are. It's a character flaw. It's right. not a location or a geographic issue. So uh, then it, the FBI finally realized, hey, maybe this has the benefit. And mm-hmm. I can't tell you the benefit of being back in Erie or in a, a, a city that you're from where people would pick up a phone and say, hey, I'm glad you're here because I know about this situation. Can you you know, help me with that? And otherwise mm-hmm. they wouldn't call up. They might not call a total stranger, but they're going to call Jerry because they know Jerry. They grew up with right. Jerry, but they also know Jerry's an FBI agent. So it's not like, hey, uh, I'm not here to get you out of your traffic tickets. I'm not here. You know, if you do wrong, I'm going to come after you. But at the same time, you're there to protect your community. I, now, I got one funny J. Edgar Hoover story, and it's not the one you think. But it's during World War II, um, there was a memo written by the FBI agents talking about they thought there there were German spies and stuff, and there's some operations they wanted to do. So Hoover makes a couple notes and sends it back to him. He says, watch the borders. So they assigned like 100 agents to watch the borders. Only about a year later did they find out J. Edgar was such a stickler for punctuation and stuff. He meant watch the borders of the page. Don't get outside the margin. (laughs) Oh, Oh, my God. There's some funny J. Edgar Hoover stories, I'll tell you that. Uh, Who was the director when you came on? So it was Louis Free when I came on. Okay. So Louis Free actually handed credentials. He went for a run. He would come down to the academy and actually run with every – every academy class down there, which was sort of neat, you know, those runs down there. Oh, yeah. Uh, you never know if you're going a mile or ten. Yep. Yellow That's, brick road? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Or the, or the tank trails. Oh, hey, the tank trails. I was, at the, I was at the academy here just a few weeks ago, the DEA academy there in Quantico, right in for our listeners. It's in the same general area as the FBI academy. And uh, they no longer allow them to run the tank trails because they found some unexploited ordnance out there. <laughs> oh no! All those years they had guys running out. Oh, there. now yeah. now it's the ATF course. <laughs> yeah, it's the ATF course. Yeah. They call them Batfa. <laughs> Who wants to name their agency Batfa? It's ATF, not Batfa. You know, right? Yeah. Or as yeah, we affectionately yeah. call, when do they show up after the fire? Um, the- <laughs> oh, that's, that's a nice way. That's a nice way of saying it. <laughs> that's a nice. Way. Hey, well, so. Um, yeah, so so now let's kind of work into this. So when did you when did you officially show up in the Erie Division or in the Erie RA? So officially assigned, I think it turned out to be like March or April of 2001. And it took a while because I had to go back and sell my house in Dayton and do all the things on the transfer. And then, uh, you know, select the house up here, got the all that mobility stuff, made it through, got back up here. And I'll tell you, it was. It, like I said, it, it was it was a glorious day. And then, you know, 9-11. And then August 28th, months later, uh, 2003, uh, you know, my whole world changed. And it's amazing how all those things I did prior to that, all those things, you know, that I think were really important, those DEA cases that I had and those high-level drug traffickers and those arrests made in Dayton on the violent crime squad all went away. Nothing mattered except pizza bomber. And my whole world became this case. Well, let's talk a little bit. So you've talked a lot about Erie. So tell us about Erie. Let's set the context now for the community because you grew up there. So where's it located? How big is it? Uh, And obviously you guys are Steelers fans. I got to just throw that out there. (laughs) Well, you're going to be surprised because Uh Erie is a very uniquely geographic location. Uh, It's in the, you know, North West corner of Pennsylvania that sticks out up into the lake. So we're an hour and a half from Pittsburgh, which is South of us. We're an hour and a half from Cleveland which is west of us, and we're an hour and a half from Buffalo, which is east of us. So we're in this triangle of Buffalo, Cleveland, Pittsburgh. And if you look at the fan base here, it's mostly Steeler, but there's a huge Buffalo Bill fan base, and there's a huge Cleveland Browns fan base. And since I spent all those years in Cleveland, I've cursed my whole family my sons, my <laughs> brothers, with being a Cleveland fan. So we're Cleveland Indians, now Guardians, you know, Cavaliers and Browns, you know, uh, supporters that have been sufferers for years. Well, you, you heard about the guy 
the, the Cleveland, the guy, his will, last will and testament, his request was he wanted six of the Browns to be his pallbearers. He wanted to be let down one last time by the Browns. Oh. <laughs> oh. But uh, I am just full, I just got him going this week. Uh, yeah, yeah this, you do. You got him going today. <laughs> so how how big is the town and what's the county? So Erie and Erie County have about 250,000 people. It's the third largest city in Pennsylvania, although recently I heard Allentown might have passed us uh, on the east side of the state, but certainly Philly's the biggest, Pittsburgh, and then Erie, Allentown. And uh, it's a it's a big, small town. I mean, people know who you are, but, you know, you're certainly uh, in a place where there's it's it's not just some you know small area. It's, it's what's, a pretty big area. What's the main like uh, industry or uh, you know sources of jobs and stuff like that? What what what's Erie known for? Yeah, it's a it's a blue collar town. General Electric, a GE had a big plant here, now called Wabtec, and and they uh, make lo- locomotives here. So all the big locomotives that you see you know uh, on on the train tracks, maybe some of them made here right here in Erie, Pennsylvania. So. They used to employ, you know, 10,000 people, 6,000 people. Then it got down to 4,000 people. And, you know, it keeps shrinking uh, its base, but big, big locomotive. Uh, plastics also, big plastics uh, place here. Many, many companies, Plastec and PHB and all these different big, big companies that make parts for a number of different things. So when the plant started going out of business, because, you know, Bethlehem Steel, U.S. Steel, a lot of these big ones, you know, started uh, losing business. People get laid off. What happened to Erie? Did you guys go through a phase to where as things got laid off, a lot of lot more drugs, a lot more crime and stuff like that? What was it like? Sure. I mean, we're, we were not immune. And the other problem for us is we're on some highway systems, Detroit, you know, Cleveland, there's drugs that run through here. And so, you know, you always look at those highway systems to see. Where, where you can transport stuff. So Erie did suffer initially, but I got to tell you, we have a, 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 you know, the lake is phenomenal, first of all, because we're right on the water. And then we also have this thing called Presque Isle, which is a bay that goes out into the lake and it's like a 13 mile park. And it's, it's one of the most beautiful kept secrets you'll ever hear uh, about. And people are surprised to hear this beautiful area of Erie. And in the summer, we have the best weather you could have because of the lake. Uh, It doesn't get overly hot. Uh, uh, It stays very nice. And then you have to deal with the winters. That's the only problem because we can get up to 200 inches a year here and be the number one snow producer in, in, in some of the bigger cities in the country. The preceding message was brought to you by the Erie Chamber of Commerce. Yeah. Courtesy of- <laughs> <laughs> Listen, the mayor and I are friends, and and uh, you know, I I, I just I, I can't be a bigger promoter of this city. And when I did my Netflix show, and Steve, you know, working with Netflix, I always said I'll I'll cooperate <laughs> with this show, but you cannot make Erie look like some run down redneck yeah, backwoods. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm just not going to do it. Yeah, and let me tell you, there was one that ABC did. Um, about the uh, plot to bomb the Somalis in Garden City, Kansas. And they made it look, I, I was a little pissed at that because they kind of made it look, ah, you're, you, I remember going to training classes and, you know, whether it's a state trooper or a detective, whatever, if you weren't from a big city like them, it's like, you didn't know shit. And it's like, Dude, what what you think you were just blessed with an extra, you know, 10 points of IQ because you <laughs> dropped into Omaha or something? <laughs> right. By the way, as I told that to a guy from Nebraska, I said, by the way, you know what the N on Nebraska's helmet stands for? What? Knowledge. Knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Where you are going. <laughs> I am. I'm on a roll. And I don't know why today. <laughs> hey, but but Jerry, so before before August uh, 28th, uh, 2003, what kind of yeah. case, what kind of things were you working on up until that day? What was the what was your uh bread and butter. So normally because I came out of that violent crime squad, I did everything on the violent crime uh, air arena in, in Erie. So anything related to the fugitives and kidnappings, unfortunately, cyber. And if you're in a small RA, the Erie only Erie office only has seven agents there. So that's considered fairly small. Well, you're going to touch on everything. So if anybody has a drug case, you're going to be doing a drug warrant. If you have a child pornography, by the way, Child pornography, another scourge of our country besides addiction, 
the two scourges for me that I noticed through a career addiction, right? Because drugs will make you do some of the most heinous, crazy, unbelievably maniacal things that you would ever think of. And, fun, and bank, fentanyl but, is killing a hundred thousand oh, Americans a year. Oh, it's, it's, it's incredible. Well, the second scourge to me is off of the internet and that's child pornography. Yeah. And I got, because of my background in psychology and knowing predators and knowing profiles and, and knowing how people think anything related to the child porn, uh, innocent images would send out leads from our Baltimore office where they'd say, Hey, you have an IP address on West third street in Erie, you know, whether it's transmitting or downloading child pornography, we do either a knock and talk, or we would do a search warrant. I'd be the guy doing the interview because it just worked out that way. And, and I love doing them because I, again, getting inside the mind of people was what I really just thrilled so me to do. Here's some place we probably we may have crossed paths. So for a year, believe it or not, from '99 through early 2000, I spent a year doing in-service training for FBI CART. Mark, oh. Mark Pollitt, Roland Lascola, those folks that were in charge of the CART unit. You know, he was the section chief, I think, yes. for CART. And, Absolutely. And then uh, you can't use an acronym and not tell us what it computer is. Computer analysis CART? response team. Steve, this is a oh, test for you. Your cognitive yeah. ability, because as we record this today, Steve had Jerry's address and was supposed to send him a headset. And yeah. guess what Steve forgot to do? Yeah. Yeah. I apologize, Jerry had Jerry. to run up to the IT department. So, okay, you can just remember <laughs> fire and effect, you know, <laughs> it goes wrong. But anyway, but the Jerry, other thing I, too would, was, I would send you a Kansas trooper hat to say, I'm sorry, but I know you don't want that. Nobody wants that. <laughs> Nobody uh, wants that. I got, I got, one for you. Hey, but the other thing, I, I love what you're talking about too, because I also spent time teaching behavior analysis interviewing at an NSA, the National wow. Security Agency. I was the first outside instructor for John Reed and Associates. So I was teaching interview and interrogation, Ooh. behavior analysis wow. interviewing. And that's, uh, you know, we, we were dealing with the damage assessment people. We had the FBI up there, CIA, uh, Fort Meade, you know, uh, uh, military intelligence from Army. And then we would go around and do training, you know, state and local as well too. But uh, I tell you, one of the funniest ones though, I was teaching at the Mayflower Hotel <clears throat> during the week when Bill Clinton came out on TV and says, I did not have sexual relations with that woman, uh, <laughs> yeah. Miss Lewinsky. And so in our class, we had FBI, we had Secret Service, we had you know other folks. And the next day, the FBI guys are going, hey, Secret Service guys, what do you think? What do you think? And all the Secret Service guys are basically flipping them off. Going, <laughs> you know, we can't say shit. So they asked us, they said, what do you guys think? And I said, I will predict now this statement will be shown to be deceptive. And here's why. He says, I did not. A non-contracted denial. Instead of saying I didn't, I wouldn't. He says, I did not. And then he says, have sexual relations. He qualified the type of relations he had. He didn't say any kind of relations. And as we found out later, you know why? Because sexual relations had a specific definition in the Paula Jones case, what it meant. And then he said, with that woman, not any woman, just that woman, Miss Lewis. And then he forgot her name and he had to go, oh, Miss Winsky. That's like saying, I did not rob that bank with this gun. <laughs> <laughs> Several things in that statement. Just very right. But I love, that's the part too. I love the interview interrogation. I love, well, people have got to remember too, there's two parts to it, right? There's the interview. There's just open-ended asking questions, following a structure. And then when you get enough information that says, leads you to believe that the person is complicit, you know, or you want to go, then you go into the interrogation. That's a little uh, something different, but I like that part too, because that's the ultimate cat and mouse game too with them is, can you get them to make an admission to say something that furthers the case, either to eliminate them as from looking at them, because you don't want to waste your time on people or saying, huh, I got you now, you son of a bitch. You don't know it, but I know it. That's it. It's it's people don't realize how challenging that is. If you move from an interview into an interrogation and now you have custody. So if you have custody and in interrogation, now you have Miranda. So yep. try to throw Miranda into something where you're saying, hey, guess what? You need to tell me what you just did, but you don't have to. And I can afford uh, or get your lawyer. If you can't afford one, I'll pay for it. And uh, you, you can stop at any time. So think about the challenges that are involved with interview and interrogation, especially interrogation. Very challenging. Well, that's, and that's a true art. And that's, I mean, that, that from what I've read and what I've, the research I've done on Jerry, you, you are a master at this, which requires it yeah. to elicit this information. Well, thank you. I, you know, somehow I just got really into the psych of it and, and it helped me so much with the background in that. And then the second part was the listening. You know, if you listen 
that means they're talking and not you. And right. if I'm talking, I'm not learning from them. So I, I think a lot of times now we want to talk a lot. We want, and I'm, I'm talking about with, 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 with subjects and uh, we, we, we got to do better and let them do the talking because they're the ones that are going to provide what they did. And, right. and that's an important lost start. I think sometimes. It and, is. And it's, and it's one of those things where you have to master that because I've seen so many cops lead the suspect to say yeah, uh, what they wanted to say rather than tell the truth. And they're now you were up, in the car with the green car, with the blacked out windows with your uh, friend, yeah. boo, who did this. And it's like, dude. Yep. Absolutely. You know? and, and, and they'll give up, you know, secrets of the investigation that they shouldn't be letting them know because you let them know what you know. And yes, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> I I actually teach that now. Like Morgan, you you have such a great background in that, and I I actually teach the students here at Gannon University, and and I'll tell them if they can answer you in a yes or no, you asked a very leading horrible question. Yeah, yeah. And so think about it that way. It was a red. Were you in that red car? Yes. I mean that's. The, the question itself is horrible. You know, what mm -hmm. color car was it? Well, now if they have to come up with red, well, it's but not see, Jerry, enough. you're assuming they were in a car. I would simply say, how did you get there that day? Well, yeah, no, that's <laughs> exactly <laughs> up even further. That's true. But no, you're exactly right. And, and we, we just want to get to the answer so quickly that we're not paying attention to the process. And if they're not telling you, uh, you you could be leading them or like Steve, you just said, you're giving them part of your case and that's, you don't want to give it good. away, man. No, nope. yeah. Nope. No, and one of the favorite tactics too was to let them know, hey, uh, and what I would do too, depending on the case, is that look, I would make it very clear, and you're not under arrest, you're not going to be arrested, you're free to go at any time. There's a door. You got that? Great. And then I would never mention it again. But one of my, so Steve knows too, when we do some of our reviews of movie, there's a couple things that are my pet peeves. Number one is when you're at the last second, still loading your clipper magazine or racking around into your gun. No, nobody, no self-respecting cop walks around like that. No. The other thing is it's terminology. They say, well, my house got robbed. No, you got robbed. Your house got burgled. There's a difference, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. And the, and the third pet peeve I have is when you watch TV and they think, uh, that if you yell and scream at people and tell them you're going to die, you're going to get the needle, you're going to prison, that all of a sudden, miraculously, they're going to tell you what they did so they can die and go to prison and get the needle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you know, and and I read in your book, you used this tactic as well, um, especially with this one female we're going to talk about here in a bit. Um, and this worked well with people who you had already arrested who had decided to flip to try to get time cut off their sentence. And you'd go into, when I was stationed in Greensboro specifically, because we did a lot of cases there, you go into the Winston-Salem jail or the or the High Point jail, and you, there are attorneys there, you know, and sometimes our prosecutors show up, sometimes there's me and another agent. But you know you're going to be there for, for several hours, and if you bring the guy a Big Mac and fries, he oh. is going to be your best friend forever because he's going to And then take food. a Polaroid with the Big Mac and fries with the big <laughs> smile on their face to go, see, Your Honor, no coercion at all. Uh, that no. helps you in court. You better believe it. It really Did does. Did you feed them? Did you give them a bathroom break? Did you take Absolutely. a second? You know, oh, man. Sure, Absolutely. there's my Big Mac. So, but here's the way I pushed the envelope to on the system. Cause I would, I'm one of like you, I, I wanted to learn. I wanted to train. I wanted to be the best at what I did. So I actually learned that we overdid the whole use of the Miranda waiver and the rights waiver and, you know, say, well, you can stop at any time and quit answering questions. No, no. actually the, what the Supreme court said is you only, you don't even have to get an acknowledgement out of them. You only have to advise them. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can be used against you. Um, if you can't, can't afford attorney one, what was it? You have the right to remain silent. You know, anything you say can't will be used against you in a court of law. Uh, you have the right to an attorney. And if you can't afford one, we'll appoint one free of charge. That's all I would say. And then I would start talking with them. And actually, we had that challenged a couple times. And the county attorney, the other ones went and pulled out the case law. I said, no, nowhere in the rulings does it say that you have to have this five page waiver that they have to read and sign at the bottom. Now, every agency does it different. But I was one of those guys that says, like, the more complicated you make it, the harder it is, right, to get an admission. So mm -hmm. you, you want to wow. keep things as simple as possible. And to your point, get to the conversation. Hey, what do you think ought to happen to the person who did this? That was yeah. one of my favorite questions. That's outstanding. You know, anyway, but we dive in. Yeah. This is not about us. This is about you, Jerry. Help us help you. Let's yeah. get back into talking about Erie now. So we've set the yeah. stage. Erie's this good town. So uh, we, and we've also good, good intel, too, that seven people in the office. Right. So, yes, August 28th, 2003 comes up. Right. What's what's that day like when you start? Are you on duty that day? You work and what's up? 
Yeah, it's a Thursday. I'm on duty. It's a beautiful sunny day. It's the weekend before Labor Day. So, uh, I mean, Labor Day is coming that weekend. And I was really excited because uh, my 25th uh, high school anniversary was uh, an alumni weekend. We had all these things planned. And uh, so I was, I was thinking, man, I got Friday and then it's the long weekend and this is going to be fantastic. You graduated in 78? 78. So did I, brother. Prep. Whoa, yeah, baby. Youngsters. You're Murph all about is the, the old guy. Murph graduated in Ot 4. He was uh, Ot 4. <laughs> Ot 4. <laughs> hey, you need to respect your elders. That. That's what you need to remember here, young man. <laughs> That's right. Steve, I would respect you more yeah. if you would remember to send headsets to our guests. Yeah, I will. You didn't, you didn't I'm going to I'm go send you one, Jerry, anyway, just because I'm getting yeah, no more to shut up. Yeah, I have one anyway. Send it to me. I'll still wear it. You didn't go to an all boy high school, did you? All male. Why you gotta hang, uh, why, why, why do you ask that, Jerry? <laughs> well, <laughs> what have you heard about Morgan? That's very similar. Erie Cathedral Prep uh, was my high school. Was all all male at the time. Now they've merged with. No, uh, actually, I went to. We have a little uh, point of history here. Speaking of Kansas, so I went to Chapman High School. Uh, nobody in, said anything about Kansas. Well, this is this is important because uh, the, the day we're okay. recording this on is April twentieth. Uh, April nineteenth was the twenty seventh anniversary of the Oklahoma City bombing, and those guys. I, I have such a tie into what those guys did, but we actually uh, one of the guys was arrested out of the county where I live. They built the bomb very close to my boyhood home in Chapman, but Chapman was the first county high school in the United States. So there you go. But hey, huh, there you go. Chamber of uh, Commerce again. Uh, anyway, oh, wait a minute. Back to, let me wake up here. Go ahead. No, go but ahead. we were we were we had students actually because we were county high school. Uh, they would we had some kids riding the bus for an hour, hour and a half each day because wow. Abilene got the county seat and Chapman got the county high school. So they would bus kids in to kind of keep it sane. But anyway, we digress. Let's get back to this. Right. So uh, yeah. it's a normal day, right. weekend before normal Labor day. day. You're going to go back yeah. to your 25th uh, um, uh, school and find out which guys used to be studs now have bald heads and a beer gut. That's it. That's right. And uh, that's so true, isn't it? Uh, but anyways, and, and all of a sudden um, I get the call and I get, I actually get it. Uh, I wasn't in the office, so I got it on a cell phone saying, hey, there's a bank robbery, 7200 Peach, Erie, Pennsylvania. Uh, can you head up there? And I said, yeah, I'm on my way. And they said, it, it could be uh, a bomb. Now, I had done enough bank robberies, you know, in my time at the, you know, Dayton RA and then through Erie, where I knew that, you know, there's some hoax bomb bank robbery. So, okay, another another bomb potential. So, but it's good to know because that's the first thing in a dispatch, right? You want to know armed and dangerous, you know, does he have a weapon or she have a weapon and you know, what's the deal and get as much Intel as you can. The problem was I didn't have a lot of Intel as I drove up to where this was. I knew I was about 15 minutes away, um, maybe shorter. Uh, so I went heavy, uh, lights and siren until I got close I ratcheted down, uh, turned the lights off, turned the siren off. Now, I'm in a, a, an FBI vehicle, which is not a marked vehicle. It's actually like a Ford Explorer or something. But I did have, you know, the, the lights inside. But, uh, and I'll never forget this. All I had was the address of the bank. I pulled up and saw a state trooper car, Pennsylvania state trooper, and I pulled in and I'm not kidding you, I look out my window and he's 30 feet from me, sitting on the pavement, meaning Mr. Wells, in handcuffs, talking to those two state troopers. And I said, holy, you know, cow, I'm too close. <laughs> yeah. That's not what you said. You can say no. it, you can say it. <laughs> Oh, holy shit. I was like, wow, what? I, 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 look at how close I am. And so that was one of those, again, those things that I talk about when I go speak. And I backed up and, and then got well, to a safer spot. Hold on a sec. So they had him handcuffed, but you said you backed up. What did you notice? And, and obviously, did you know his name at that time? Or did you just know that they had somebody in custody? I knew they had someone in custody. I did not know his name. I just knew he was handcuffed and the state troopers were leaning over their vehicle. You see that in the video, if you watch yep. the video, and they're talking to him. And so I pulled, you know, not far, but I pulled to the side so that I could hear them and see him. 
What, what so did you think when you saw this? Close. I mean, normally when you got bank robbers, you know, you make arrests like that. They're face down on the ground, handcuffed behind them. You know, you got cops around them, but you're sitting, seeing this guy now sitting down, legs crossed, handcuffs behind his back. What are you thinking when you see that guy out there like that? You're going, what the hell are the troopers doing back here? Did the guy fart, you know, or something? Did he smell yeah. bad or what? I'm thinking, okay, they're, they're being, uh, you know, abundance of caution. They're being very safe. They, they're, they're, they're doing the right thing. They're in conversation. But I was also thinking in my mind, oh, just stand up and get this over with. You know, just take this thing off and, and you know, it's a hoax. Let's just end the day. You got the guy. It's over, you know. And, and I'll never forget that because anybody who pulled up on that scene that day, because as I was there, people started pulling up. Other troopers, another FBI agent pulled up came over, stood where I was, and we're just chatting on, oh, man, you know, it's another hoax. Let's just get this over. But because we're law enforcement and because we follow protocol, mm -hmm. we call the bomb squad. The bomb squad is a regional group. So it's a group that have to assemble and get together because they have other is jobs. It federal or they, state and local bomb group? It's all state and local at that point. So, you know, local Erie Police Department bomb squad are, are, are in route. They're having trouble getting up this main road called Peach Street. And Erie Peach Street is, is, is the main, you know, north and south here. And, you know, there's a lot of traffic because they were trying to block off things. And they finally got up there and were literally putting their gear on. And I'll never forget this. And the, here's, here's another part that will bother me about this case forever. With all the psychology and all the knowledge that I had with interview and interrogation, I was listening to the troopers and they were doing an outstanding job and I would never say anything otherwise. I just felt like I wanted to interject in some way, you know, to say, hey, uh, you know, and ask a question myself. But then I thought, no, what are you doing? You know, they're already doing a fantastic job. Just listen and, and, and well, let on. them get their answers. You know, you want to say the famous line, I'm from the FBI, I'm here to help. Um, I'm, I'm <laughs> here to take over. You can leave now. You know, get in your car. You got them arrested for me. Just By the way, off. we need to put out a press release, boys. Yes, exactly. Get the press rolling. So, no, I, I'm not, I, I, I couldn't have, but, it, but in my mind, I was thinking, you know, maybe if I said something, you know, it would have been helpful, but it, Looking back, maybe it wouldn't have because they had rapport. You know, you as an interviewer, you know, there's that rapport that's developed. And I thought he asked an unbelievable question when he said, how did you end up here? How did you end up in that spot you're in? Which is an outstanding question mm -hmm. when, I, when I think about that. Because he's not saying, you know, who did this to you? Not yet. He said, how'd you end up here? Well, I went to the tower site. I delivered pizzas from Mama Mia's. And, and I went to this tower site to deliver pizzas and a group of black men uh, pulled a gun and put this thing around and told me to go rob the bank. And then the next question they said was, well, describe the black men, right? And he couldn't. And immediately while I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, this is interesting. The fact that he specifically said black and that he couldn't describe that person, I immediately thought, boy, that sounds made up. That story just doesn't jive with, with me. The other thing that didn't jive with me was his sort of calmness. He was not in a panic mode. Like if you thought you had a live device around your neck, you'd be, you know, just, bullets, man. I'd be like, oh, get this thing off of my neck. Get this off of me now. Get, you know, and he wasn't like that. You know, hey, did you call my boss? Can I have a cigarette? Uh, you know, he was just asking sort of questions that I don't know. It, it, so that that struck me at that second. Can you go back and just I don't mean to interrupt you. Could, can you when no. you pulled up in the parking lot, describe what you saw that Brian Wells had on? So I could I could I was as close as I wanted and closer to see that he had a shirt that said guess, and I could clearly see it said guess on it. And then underneath it said jeans, but guess mm -hmm. jeans. Mm -hmm. And it was a white shirt and he had, he, he had this 
thing under the shirt and I could definitely see it. And I, I thought initially it looked like, you ever see someone with a neck injury? They wear that halo yeah. like. That yeah. or they have the scoliosis and they had the neck brace, you know, to yes. scrape. Yeah. That's yeah. exactly the metal what thing I was around them. Yeah. thinking. I thought, boy, it looks similar to that, but he definitely had something under it. Uh, I didn't know at the time that the trooper, Jim Szymanski, who did an outstanding job, actually ran up before I got there when they first initially handcuffed him, took his knife out, slid, slit the shirt and opened it and looked and actually saw the device. Mm. The shirt went back down and then he ran back to the car. I didn't know that part. I just saw the shirt and the device. Later, I would interview Jim Szymanski, who's a friend of mine, and say, hey, what did you see? And he actually drew for us what the what he had seen because he's the only person that had seen it before right. it detonated. Right. So we're just standing there and their time's going by and he's going, come get this thing off me. You know, it's heavy and I don't have a lot of time, but he wasn't in a panic. And I still can hear that voice uh, and how he was talking. It's still to this day. I mean, it's like 19 years later. But Jerry, you bring up a really good point too. Um, I'd actually worked a case with our FBI agent, some bank robbery stuff. Uh, there was, they stole, st long story short, ended up interviewing this guy. And I said, there's something else there. He goes, yeah, you mean the bank robberies? And come to find out, um, these guys would rob banks. And what they would do is they would get like a lockbox and plumber's putty and like a little bit of wires and make it look like a bomb. Then they would close the lid, turn the key, take the key with them. And what it did was it slowed down the investigation to the bank robbery because your number one priority was to find and diffuse what appeared to be a bomb. And so it gave them an extra amount of time for them to get out of the area. And that's the thing here is that everybody, you know, it's like you just can't get into investigating the robber yet because priority number one is, do we have a live device on this guy? Absolutely a true point, Morgan. You couldn't be more right because you can't do it. You, you feel like you're just time standing still because you can't investigatively do anything till that's clear. And I had seen flares taped together and uh, banks with uh, one guy had a binocular case with an antenna sticking out and he robbed a bank. And, and, and so I had seen hoaxes before and you have to call the bomb squad and then they'll, you know, air shoot them or, or water, you know, shoot them or something and detonate them. And there's nothing there. There's no uh, destructive device there. So I'm just thinking this is the same thing. We know we're going through the process and we got to believe that it could be true, but you know, basically they're going to find out uh, it's a hoax. Uh, and then as my life would change like his uh, in different ways, and believe me, his much worse than mine at 318, I'll never forget the time 318. We hear a faint beep, beep, beep. And he swings a little bit. He's on his, he's still, you know, uh, sitting on his legs, but he just turns a little bit. You can barely see it in the video. And then, bam. And when it goes off, it was just a collective, holy shit mm -hmm. uh, moment. How, how long had he been on the ground there uh, before it went off? So I'm, I'm thinking he's been there probably at that point, 15 minutes or so. Uh, he robbed the bank uh, around two o'clock. Uh, he, he's up at the tower site. They put it on. He drives down to the bank somewhere between two and two fifteen. He gets in the bank. Uh, he's pulled over. Uh, and I'll tell you what, we're, we're just standing there in shock at what we had just seen. And this is the part that really amazes me. He fell backwards. He didn't fall forward. He fell backward, and he's laying on the ground. I'm watching his chest, and his chest goes down, and I'm waiting for it to come back up, you know, for breath, nothing. No, no movement. It went out and never back up, and I go, oh, my God, this is, this is absolute death, and it just... It, it, it was completely a shock. It really was. I, I got to tell you. And you could feel, uh, I was close enough to feel the percussion from it, you know, and you could hear 
like the jangling of things hitting the road, which mm -hmm. was basically the device in pieces, just sort of going all over the street. How close was close when you say that? Uh, I'm probably, when I look back now, I'm probably 30 feet from him. And Was that still uh, too close at that point? I think it was looking back now. It's kind of like, wait, what were we, what were we doing in the cane fields, right? It's like, yeah, what the hell sure. was I thinking? What were we thinking? But let, let me ask you about that, what you were thinking, because you got to have a variety of things going through your mind. Did you, if, if it were a device, did you guys have any contingencies? Well, what if he gets up and starts running towards us? What's if he gets up and starts to leave? What if he tries, if he's got a real device, the last thing you want him to do is to go back towards civilians or to go back toward, you know, innocent people. Did you guys have time to game out any of that? There was no conversation about it, but when we talked about it later, the troopers were ready to tase him so that they could maybe try to get him, uh, you know, on the ground where he's not moving toward people. But it was it, it was very much volatile and fluid. You know, that would have been know. dangerous in and of itself because you got to get not you got to be closer than that to use a taser, and then a taser is an electromagnetic electromagnetic discharge that could have set off uh, the explosive itself if you'd hit the anywhere near the device, right? No question. And there was a, it was like a lose, lose. Any way that you looked at it, there wasn't any good way to get in and around this thing. Uh, so we were sort of grateful that he stayed put where he was and never got up because I don't know what would have happened. Uh, those were some thoughts that we thought of later. Uh, you know, obviously a deadly force or lethal force of shooting him, uh, might've been an option too, but you don't know if that's a live device or not. And now you shoot a, a guy that has a fake device. So it's, it was a, a loser all the way around. Well, uh, and, and that's where you feel sorry for the officers who get involved in things where people have an airsoft pistol or some, a replica, but you don't know yeah. it's that, like I say, have something pointed at you and in one tenth of a second, determine if it's legit or not, because if you don't, they're going to shoot you, you know, instead. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things, the The biggest mistake I see a lot of people want to do, they want to go back and second guess everything you did. Well, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? And like you said, I think it goes back to, it's so fluid. It's going on right at that point, right? And your first priority is protection of the public. Um, when you saw, when that explosion went off, describe the, the, the sound. I mean, when you said you felt the percussion, but how loud was it? You know, that was the part that was interesting to me. And I had to talk to our bomb tech. Uh, Dr. Kirk Yeager, uh, of the the really guru of IEDs, you know, intermittent explosive devices at FBI Quantico. And later he would tell me a couple things that I didn't realize at the time. Number one, if you looked at the troopers that were over the car that had made the arrest, when that went off, the one trooper actually fell backwards himself all the way onto his back. So he's leaning over the car, and now he's on his back because of that that percussion. The percussion was, uh, you know, more palatable than the actual noise. The noise sounded to me like a, a large fire, like an M80 or something. Mm -hmm. It wasn't as loud as I thought it would be. And the second thing that I never knew until I saw this in slow motion was the flame out. So it had black powder in it, which made a flame. And if you can see that in slow motion, you will, it's incredible. The, 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 the powder burning is really noticeable. But when I saw it live, your eye can't pick that flame out fast enough. And I didn't see that. So I heard the bang, the percussion, him falling back, the chest never going back up. And then I thought, man, I think the guy, I think he's dead. I mean, it was one of those where, you know, TV had portrayed his head blew off and, you know, none of that, none of that happened. Well, Jerry, yeah, hold on. That's an interesting point too, because when you look at dealing with the guys that deal with IEDs over in the Middle East, Afghanistan, or when they've had suicide vests, uh, and I was over in Israel talking with some guys there. One of the ways you identify suicide bombers is when they wear the vest, it does, it decapitates them. It takes the head off. But that's because they use, I think, a lot more explosives. So on this one, you know, we just we want to be respectful. But but, but obviously, you we're going to describe what uh, what he looked like, right? But again, it's not it's not that big. But the the black powder and stuff, I think that's the difference too. It's black powder versus like C four 
you know, or something else, right? Yes, exactly. It was actually taken from shotgun shells, which we later determined to be the interesting part of this. Uh, the bomb maker had cut the tops of shotgun shells and poured the black powder, powder. into the into the uh, pipe. And that's how they, they made that device. But um, the flame was definitely there. And uh, it, it basically dug a trench, is the way I describe it, in where his chest is that hit many of the vital, you know, lungs and heart area. And that's why there was, you know, almost, I guess, an instant death of the way it was described. Mm -hmm. So what are your, what are your first reactions after this goes off? Like, see, so you see the trooper fall back, you feel the percussion. I mean, there's that initial, like, you can't believe what you just saw. Right. And just what you heard is like, I mean, the first thought is like, Oh shit, it really was a bomb. Yeah, that's the first thing you're thinking. That number one, I can't just believe uh, what 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 just happened. And then the second thing is because we're all cops, we're very nosy and intuitive. We want to run up and see. So the two troopers started running up, and then everybody's yelling, you know, secondary, secondary. Get back! That's right. Yeah, because they thought, hey, if this is rigged to have you know first ex you know responders killed. Mm -hmm. So we were smart enough at the time and composed ourselves enough to pull back and then just wait now because the bomb squad had literally just gotten suited up and they were ready to now make an advance. And so we actually had a bomb tech in, you know, the suit actually make advance up to the body to render it uh, what we thought to be safe. That is the end of part one of FBI Special Agent Jerry Clark and the Pizza Bomber case. Man, as you can see, this is already going in a lot of strange places. Stay tuned for part two to find out where it ends up at. In the meantime, go visit us at GameOfCrimesPodcast.com, our website, where we've got Jerry's four books on there. You've got to check them out. You've got to read them. It's a lot of great stuff. Also, follow us on the socials at Game of Crimes on Twitter, at Game of Crimes Podcast on Facebook and the Instagram. But where you got to be, where you got to be, where you got to be is Patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. We've got a lot of great content on there. We just did a 911 call, as we talked about in the intro. This one will take you in a lot of twists and turns like the pizza bomber case. Stay tuned, guys. We really appreciate your support for the show. Next, part two, FBI Special Agent Jerry Clark and the pizza bomber case. <laughs> <laughs>